John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. That was a lively good morning. I appreciate that. Um, I hope everybody had a great, great Thanksgiving. Uh, I know we did. Um, So today we are kind of finishing off Matthew for a little bit, then we're kicking in to a four-week Christmas series, and we'll jump back into Matthew come 2024. So if you have your Bibles with you or an app, a fake Bible with you, it'll also be on the screen. Uh, We're in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 43. Uh, These are the words of Jesus. So if you remember last week, we kicked off chapter 13 into the parables. Now the word parables is used about 48 times in the Gospels alone, except the Gospel of John. And the Greek word for parables is parabole, and it literally means to cast alongside something, to cast alongside something that is unknown, something that is known, right? These are, again, earthly practical stories to convey a deep, deep heavenly spiritual truth, right? One third of all of Jesus' teachings were in story parable form, right? It's his way of explaining things to me like, Jesus, tell me, I understand, but tell for these people like they're three, right? It's it's like one of those things where he breaks it down so that the layman can understand these deep, deep spiritual truths. And these parables in Matthew 13, these are specifically kingdom parables. So you'll hear Jesus say, even today throughout the three parables that we'll go through, he'll say the kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like repeat, repeat. So today we continue with a few more parables. We're going to talk about the parable of the weeds and the tares, a parable of the mustard seed, and the parable of the leaven. Uh, But before we really get into these three parables, let me briefly revisit the parable last Sunday, the parable of the sower who sows seeds into four different types of soil, the soil being the condition of our heart that receives this truth. And let me submit to you, like I said last Sunday, every one of you in this room, you are one of these four soils, right? The, the, the rocky ground, the hard ground, the, the thorny ground, the shallow ground, or the receptive ground, or the hard ground. But one of you, all of us, are one of those four soils But let me say this, at least for me, I didn't mention it last Sunday, and I should have. It really gives at least me, and I hope us, this hope and this insight into what God could do if you would invest and sow the truth of God into their lives. Okay, That you would see your workplace, your friend circle, your classroom, your sphere of influence as a field... And the potential of what God could do if you would sow a seed in someone's life and you just don't know what that could do, right? We live in a day where we want instant results, so we want gospel presentation, instant conversion, but usually it doesn't happen that way and usually it takes some time for that seed to germinate and next thing you know, years later, they come back to you, hey Frank, I remember when you told me that five years ago, I'm now a Christian, it's amazing, right? So please, those people in your life that you, have, you may have said, you know, they are a lost cause, please, please, as long as there is hope, as long as there is breath, rather, there is always hope in Jesus, amen, right? And so let me give you an example from my personal life. Three years ago, we were still at the schoolhouse. We were going through Colossians, um, and I told our people, including myself, kind of a homework assignment, and I told them, uh, hey, would you write a letter for you young people, what a letter is? It's like they take wood and they compress it. It's called paper. And this long stick and you start writing on it and things appear. And then you fold it and you put it into another compressed piece. We call it an envelope. And you lick something and you send it. And it gets to their house in a few days. 
So I told our people to write a letter and send it to somebody and thank them, like a letter of gratitude, right? Not an email, not a text, not a ping, not a DM, but an actual envelope, lick it, stamp it, send it, piece of letter. So for me, I sent it to my brother all the way in Seattle, who's not a Christian, by the way, yet. Um, And so I sent it three years ago, and I heard nothing for like two years. Not even a, hey, I got your letter. Not a text, nothing. Hey, I received your letter. Um, So I forgot about it. Two years later, like last year, I'm talking to my brother because he was getting married, um, and out of the blue, he says, hey, Frank, remember that letter you sent? And I literally said, what letter? And Mari's like, babe, the one for, you know, Colossians, the one you told everybody else to do? It's like, oh, yeah. And my brother said, Frank, I just want you to know that I received your letter, and Frank, I want you to know that I read your letter, and Frank, I want you to know that I am now at a place where I am open to hearing about Jesus. So hear me, if you knew my brother, um, if you you knew my brother, how stubborn he is, how self-reliant he can be, that statement, he's not a Christian yet, but him saying, I'm now open to hearing about Jesus, that ground is becoming a little bit tilled. So I'm praying there will come a day where my brother will accept the Lord Jesus as his rescuer, as his savior, as his king. So with that said, same goes for you. I I know as I say this, there may be somebody that pops up in your mind's eye, family, friend, co-worker, like they don't know Jesus. You do. So I need you to know that you are not in your friend circle as the only Christian coincidentally. You are not at your job that you hate coincidentally. I'm not saying don't look for another job, but in the season you're in, you're not there on accident. You're not with your family that can really grind your gears, but you're the only Christian. You're not there on accident. That you would sow the seed of God's truth and see what not you, you and I can't save anybody. All we are called to do is sow that seed and God will cause the growth. God will convert the soul. God will change someone's life. And so what happens is, at least, at least in my life, there's this weird ungodly pressure of I have to say it the right way, in the right tone, I have to get it all right, or if I mess up, then they're going to go to hell. Hear me, you're not that good. I'm not that good. We sow the seed, let God do the rest. We obey, trust the results to the Lord, amen? So whoever those people are, keep praying, keep sowing, keep sowing, and you never know, years later, they may say, hey, remember when you talked to me about that Jesus guy years ago? I was half asleep, but I remembered, and I want you to know that I am now a born-again Christian. Amen. It can happen. It does happen. Some of you, it has happened, okay? This is what God can do, right? So the first parable today, Matthew 13, 24 through 30, that part is the parable of the wheat and the weeds, or the wheat and the tares, as some of your translations will say. So just to give you the the 100,000 foot view of this, the wheat in this parable, they are, the wheat is the genuine, true believer. The weeds or the tares, these are the false believers. Let's read it. These are the words of Jesus. Verse 24, he put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds also appeared. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, 
then do you want us to go and gather all of them, the weeds? But he said, no. Lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. So let them both grow together until it's harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Let me pray. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would uh, soften the hearts of our people. Um, God, we know that there is true belief and there is false belief. There is true doctrine and there is false doctrine. There is a true church and there is a false church. So God, I pray that you would work in us that you would soften our hearts for the message that we are about to hear today. Holy Spirit, do a work. And we pray this in your good name, Jesus. Amen. Um, So he talks about the wheat and the tares. Um, This is why I love the Bible. Um, The wheat and the, the, the weeds or the tares in the Greek, it's the word zizanion. Say zizanion. And it is actually a grain called the bearded darnel. You could Google image the bearded darnel. And here's the amazing part. The bearded darnel, guess what? Looks identical to wheat when they first start growing. So servants back then would go out and they could not tell the difference of which one is wheat and which one is the bearded darnel. And back then, if you hated somebody, what you would do is you would sneak into their field and you would sow seeds of the bearded darnel in their garden. And the Romans actually had a law against this back in that time. So at first, you cannot tell the difference, but once it forms its head, then you can tell that's wheat, that's a tear, that is true, that is false, that is genuine, that is fake. But until then, that's why they said, hey, don't pull them out because as you pull out the tears, you may mistakenly pull out the wheat as well because they look identical until the head sprouts and it's harvest time. Does that make sense? Right. He said in verse 30 again, no less than gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Right? Don't pull them up. Because they look alike, so you're going to pull up some wheat thinking it's a tear accidentally. Wait till it's harvest time, and the reapers will come in, and they will shuffle that deck. Here is the big idea, friends. I need you to know this. Satan cannot create anything. He can only imitate. God creates, Satan counterfeits. This is his strategy, this is his M.O. Because, hear me, anything valuable, you're going to find a counterfeit. You look at all the expensive brands, there's always a knockoff counterfeit because it's valuable, so people can't afford this, so let me make a knockoff that looks like the real thing, feels like the real thing, but it's not the real thing. When I was 16, I worked at, my first job was at A&W Root Beer Burger in Kent, Washington. Nice. (laughs) First job. Um, And Kent, Washington, if you know that area, is not the safest part. So my boss, the first thing he did, one of the first things he taught me as an employee at 16 was, Frank, here is how you identify a counterfeit bill because we have a lot of those coming in into this A&W. Hear me, what he did not do when he trained me, he didn't lay out the hundred types of counterfeits that have walked in through these doors. Get familiar and know how to identify all of these counterfeits. No, no, that's not efficient. What he did, you need to get very familiar with the real thing that when a fake thing comes in, You're so familiar with the real thing, you can quickly discern that's not a real bill. This doesn't feel like it. Like the contrast, the green is off, the hue is off, the texture is off, because I've been trained like this is the real thing, 
This is a true thing that when a fake thing that looks like the real thing comes in, I can identify the fake thing because I've been so familiar and trained in the real thing. Amen. As it is with dollar bills, so it is with our spiritual life. That we will be so familiar with the truth, so familiar with the true doctrine, that when a false counterfeit thing comes in, we can quickly identify that's not right, that feels off, that's not true, something in my gut. And by the way, when your gut says something, usually as a Christian, it is the Holy Spirit. Are you familiar with the real thing? Some of you, you don't know what the real thing feels like. You haven't studied it. You haven't dwelled in it. You're a lazy Christian student that you would much rather read books about the Bible than the Bible. You would much rather see Instagram reels about these influencers talking about the Bible than the Bible. One thing that really irritates me, it's not in my notes. I saw this recently. It's called a thirst trapping. You guys know these young people? It's horrendous. Like, it's a really good looking dude just staring into the camera with a verse with music, and there's no talk. He's just staring, trying to seduce you into Christianity. And that's it. And people are like, oh my goodness, I'm going to share this a thousand times. This is where we're at. You would much rather watch Christian thirst trapping about the Bible that's nothing to do with the Bible than read the Bible for yourself so there's no familiarity with the real thing when a counterfeit comes in looking like it, acting like it, but it's not it, you get fooled and you get sucked right in. Are you familiar with the real thing? This is why one of the many reasons why we at this church, we primarily will go through entire books of the Bible verse by verse. Why? How do cults start? How do weird spirituality start? They take one verse, pop it out, and they can prove anything you want to prove. Right? Are you familiar with the real thing? Have you dwelled in it? Have you studied it? Do you linger? Have you tasted and seen? Man, God and his word, it is so good, it is so real, it is so accurate because it's not a history book, it is a living book, right? That's my prayer, that we as Christians would be so familiar that we can identify, again, not in a critical, mean-spirited way, but in a very discerning way, that's off, that's not true. This happened, Bible says this. This will never contradict the Bible if it's of God, ever, ever. The Holy Spirit, hear me, will always lead you into and towards the word of God, never away, never away. Okay. In the same way, Satan cannot create, he can only imitate Satan cannot uproot the plants, the plants being the true, genuine believers. Right? So instead, he plants counterfeit Christianity, counterfeit Christians. In this parable today, the seed is the truly converted souls of the believer. And unlike the parable of the sower last week where the field was the human heart, the field in this parable, it is the world. It is the world. So Jesus, he is sowing true believers all around this field, the world, in various places so that we may bear a lot of fruit so that kingdom advancement can happen. But wherever Christ sows a true believer, Satan sows a counterfeit believer or a counterfeit church or a counterfeit religion. So Tove Church, hear me, right? With a discerning heart, we have to be aware of counterfeit Christianity. It's out there. Okay. Just because they say Jesus doesn't mean they're Christians. Okay. There are counterfeit Christians. 
2 Corinthians 11. There is a counterfeit gospel, Galatians 1, a distorted gospel. There is a counterfeit righteousness where you're trying to get righteousness of your own, Romans 10. There are counterfeit churches, Revelation 2. Usually they have rainbow flags flying in their front lawn. And at the end of this age, he will produce, based on 2 Thessalonians, a counterfeit Christ. Friends, we got to be aware of counterfeit Christianity and the discerning, discerning, I know the real thing, this just feels off in that way. So we got to wake up, church. I know that that's been a thread in the past four sermons. We need to be awake. Don't be critical. Be discerning because when God's people go to sleep, Satan starts to work. Right? I said last week, he is never too busy to rock the cradle of a sleeping saint. Right? Our main role as Christians, as true, genuine Christians, hear me, it's not to uproot and pull up the false. It is rather to continue to plant the true. Amen? Hear me, I'm not saying, yes, we must oppose Satan, we must oppose and expose his lies, but we must sow the word of God and bear fruit where he has planted us now. Right? So our primary role is not detective, our primary role is evangelist. What do I mean? Tell people about Jesus. Tell your friends about Jesus. Jesus. This amazing Jesus that saved you from death to life. Tell your coworkers and your family and your friends and your sphere of influence about this amazing Jesus. What do we do when we eat at an amazing restaurant? You tell your, at least I do, I tell my friends. It's like, bro, you got to try this place. They have the best steaks in Pittsburgh. And what gives me a lot of joy is they come back. It's like, Frank, you're right. That is the best steak in Pittsburgh. Right? We get so excited about restaurants, about movies, about whatever. Right? And yet we have the greatest thing in the history of the world that we profess. Jesus saved me from darkness to light. I was in a ditch, and now I belong to him. This is amazing, and yet when it comes to sharing this awesome steak and this awesome restaurant, we're more squeamish. That we are called to be evangelists and tell people about the Lord. Amen? Can we do amen to that? It's amazing, right? And the question is, based on verse 30, is what's going to happen to the weeds and the tares. Okay. Um, 30 says, let both grow together until it's harvest. And when it's harvest, the reapers will gather the weeds, bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. It's interesting. He says, bind them into bundles, the tares. What is interesting is I believe this bundling is already happening today. What do I mean by this? We have various religious groups under the umbrella of what, what we'll call Christendom, various religious groups merging together in the name of unity, striving for unity, saying, you know, we're all kind of in the same boat. We all believe in God, and we're all headed in the same direction, and it's just your path is different than your path, than my path, so we're all just kind of united together knowing that we have these unique paths leading to the same ultimate destination. The bundling is already happening. Right? Hear me, spiritual unity amongst true Christians is an amazing thing. It's something that needs to be pursued. But religious uniformity amongst mere spiritual people 
That's a whole different thing. And we got to be discerning. And I've talked about this before. There's a difference between state borders and national borders. State borders is, man, we have these borders and we have our state distinctions, but we're all still a part of the same country, USA. So there are state border issues that we can have debate on, but these to me are not die on a hill, break fellowship issues. Do you believe in infant baptism? Do you believe in adult baptism? I have my opinions, but I'm not going to stake my flag on that hill. Do you have women in leadership or no women? I'm not going to stake my flag on that hill. Do you believe that when you drink the blood, it, it literally turns into, or the juice, it turns into the Christ's blood as it enters your body, literally? I have my opinions, but I'm not going to stake my flag. on. These are all state border issues that we may disagree, but we're all still wearing the same jersey for the same team. Then you have national borders. Jesus is God. He did die on the cross in your place for your sins. Penal substitutionary atonement, meaning he took your place. He took the punishment that you should have felt. He rose again from the grave. The Bible is the word of God. It's perfect. These are things that we will go to war over. These are national borders. This is Canada. Double meaning, I guess. But this is a whole different country. We can be cordial. We can be nice. But we cannot have this deep fellowship because you are wearing the different team's jersey. So we are all for religious unity amongst true Bible-believing, not false, but true churches going after the same mission, great commission, telling everybody about this Jesus, this gospel, which we are not ashamed of, and because it is a power of God, we're all for that. But what we are not for is just this vague religious uniformity under the name of we're all spiritual beings. We got to be careful. We got to be discerning. Verse 31, he goes into the second parable. He put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like, there it is again, a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nest in its branches, right? So I know, are there smaller seeds in the world than a mustard seed? There is, right? But back then, in this place, in this time, the mustard seed was the small seed, okay? Um, So this parable right here about the mustard seed um, may be one of the most misinterpreted parables, Uh, The most popular interpretation that I've seen, I've heard, is that the mustard seed in this parable is the gospel, and it spreads, and it grows, and this small seed produces something so substantial like a tree, and its branches are strong enough to have birds to nest in. It's just this evangelistic, it's spreading, the gospel. Um. Hear me, since Jesus, unlike last week with the sower, he explained that one, he told the parable, and then he said, okay, here's what this means. Unlike the other parables, Jesus, hear me, doesn't explain this one. He doesn't say, here's what the mustard seed is, here's what the bird is, here's what these branches are. He doesn't explain it. So what we need to do is be not lazy Christian students and look in the other parables to find the meaning of this parable. So if you remember a little quiz, last week there was a bird in the sower based on Jesus' teaching explanation of that parable. What did the bird represent? Satan. The bird was the one that came and snatched the seeds. Okay. The tree, as you read scripture, as you read passages like Daniel 4, Ezekiel 17, it will show that the tree is a symbol of world power. Okay. 
So hear me, with those explanations, as we read into other parables, as we look at the whole counsel of God, since Jesus doesn't explicitly explain this one, this parable suggests this abnormal, false, fake growth in the kingdom that makes it possible for Satan to still work in it. Okay. I'll move on, and we'll, we'll come back to this. Verse 33, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. If you were a Jewish person hearing this from Jesus, they would have knew exactly what he was talking about because every Jewish kitchen in that time would have had this little bit of set-aside fermented dough to put aside and then use it a little bit in their new batch of dough. So my wife, she is, and I love her for it, she is super into making sourdough from scratch, and it's amazing. But she has this thing called... um, Babe, are you in the room? Starter, yes. Starter. And she treats it like a pet. It's like, it's die, I gotta feed it. It's alive, it's dead, I gotta feed it. It's a thing. So every new batch of sourdough, she puts a little bit of that fermented dough into that new batch to give it that fermented sourdough like amazing taste. But this is a dough, this is a yeast that permeates through the new batch of dough. Like the mustard seed parable, this also has been misinterpreted. And the most popular interpretation of this parable is that the leaven is like the gospel permeating into the world. But hear me, like the mustard seed I'm submitting parable symbolizes false outward expansion, this parable of leaven symbolizes false inward development. Again, Jesus does not explain this parable either. He doesn't say, this is what the leaven means. So we have to, again, look at scripture as a whole. The best way, the best thing to interpret scripture with is scripture itself. Throughout scripture, if you've read it, you know that leaven is usually a symbol of evil. Leaven had to be removed from the Jewish house during Passover. Leaven was excluded from the sacrifices made in the Old Testament. Jesus used leaven to describe the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. He used leaven to describe the false doctrine of the Sadducees. He used leaven to also describe worldly compromise. The Apostle Paul also used leaven to describe carnality and false doctrine within the church. So with all that said, to use this parable to symbolize the spread of the gospel is simply not accurate. Are you guys mopping up what I'm spilling here? You guys with me? Okay. Um, so there's false teaching, there's, there's false growth, there's, there's false expansion, there's, there's false inward development. Hear me, Satan has worked very hard and still works very hard to introduce and plant false doctrine, false living, false churches into the ministry of his very true word. It's true. Look around. Nothing has changed. God is still alive. And Satan is still at work. Satan's day will come, but until that day, he's still at work. God loves you. Satan hates you. God wants to bless you. Satan wants to undermine every blessing. God wants you to give him the glory. Satan wants you to take all the glory for yourself. He wants for you to reach your fullest potential for your mission, for your vision, because it sounds super godly and spiritual. This is today what we will call, I said it before, this big umbrella, it's on the screen, called Christendom. It's just a fancy word for, I believe in God. I'm spiritual. We believe in a higher being. It's this kind of worldwide power that reaches in like the work field, political realm, right? With a complex organization of 
these many branches like the mustard seed tree. This is where it could get a little offensive. This is where a true born-again Christian, and I've seen it, is in the same category as a Mormon. That a true born-again Christian, that we're in the same category as a Jehovah's Witness. A true born-again Christian, you're in the same category as a Unitarian church. You're in the same category as a unification church. We're all kind of the same vague team. No, we're not. The Mormon church is a false church. They believe in a false Christ. They believe in a false gospel. Just because you call yourself the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints doesn't mean you're a Christian. And they will try to make themselves look very normal and approachable and just like the Christians, but if you dig a little deeper, they are a false church. They believe Jesus was a created being who became God. Whereas we believe Jesus is God, has always been God from the beginning national border. Okay. Jehovah's Witnesses is also a false church. They believe in a false gospel. They do not believe in the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three separate persons, one God. Frank, that doesn't make sense. I know our, our brain is not that smart. They do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus, national border. Okay. They believe that Jesus was a created being as the archangel Michael, national border. Okay. Friends, as Galatians 1 says, as Paul says very strongly, if anybody, even an angel, preaches to you a gospel that I haven't preached, let him be accursed. Any gospel, any church that takes Jesus out of the forefront and makes it into someone or something else, it's a false gospel. Okay. Just because they say Jesus, just because they are spiritual, just because they pray to a higher power, just because they have a massive cross necklace around their neck doesn't mean they are a true believer. Okay. He continues, verse 36 through 43. Then he, Jesus, left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Jesus, we don't understand. Could you explain to us the parables of the weeds and the tares in the field? He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, that's Jesus. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. These are true, genuine believers, sons and daughters of God. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. Friends, if you are not a believer, your father is the devil. The Bible is clear. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers. That would include all of us, by the way. And throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <clears throat> There's a group of Christians, and they call themselves the, the red letter Christians. And they would say that we don't read or adhere to Paul or Luke, or we, we just, we are just the words of Jesus. 
forgiveness and love and all of that. We are just red letters, but they always conveniently leave out these red letters. These are the words of Jesus. And Jesus, in red letters, say, he will send his angels and the reapers will gather the causes of sin and the lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be gnashing of teeth. Let me be very clear. He's talking about a literal hell. Right? Um, and it's, it's always just intriguing to me. The 9 a.m. service was the biggest one we've ever had. It's always these sermons that we have our biggest services. Um, I am, and I've said this before, I believe I am a dying man preaching to dying men. So for me, the worst and most selfish thing that I could do right now is just say, you're fine, God loves you, he accepts you the way accepts you just the way you are. Go in peace. Um, hell is not figurative, as some believe. Hell is not just a state of being, as some believe. Hell is a literal place, and forever is a very, very long time. And please, I hope you hear my heart. I say this with urgency. I say this because I really do love you, but more than you, I'm more concerned about your soul than your feelings. If there is a semi headed directly at you, how messed up of me is it just to say nothing, do nothing, and let that semi hit you if I believe what the Bible says? And if you are in the room, and if you're not a believer, or you're a false believer, you're religious, you're pious, you're spiritual, there is a semi headed your way. And people always say, I, I've, I've done this through email and through conversation, they say, well, Frank, I don't believe in hell. Friends, if you don't, when you close your eyes on this side, you will. And I say this with a lot of weight on my heart, but Jesus, he talks about it. He talks about hell more than anybody else in the Bible. So my fear and my concern, which is why I try to preach with urgency every Sunday is I am concerned for your soul. Because we're in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where religion is a thing. And you have people banking on the confirmation they had when they were five for their salvation. Or I was baptized when I was seven, so I'm I'm good. Verse 43, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So that's what I'm praying for, that you would have ears and you are hearing. And if the soil of your heart is hard, that the Holy Spirit will start tilling it and softening it knowing that your good morality is not going to save you, friends. You tithing 55% every day is not going to save you. You being spiritual and doing crystals is not going to save you. Only the saving work of the person of Jesus dying on the cross in your place for your sins, only he can save you. That's my plea to you this morning. 
Do you have a saving, life-giving relationship with Jesus where you realize, I am a sinner, I need a Savior, you are that Savior, thank you. So this passage, as we just read, it says the, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. That's what verse 36 says. That means the original sower is who? The original sower is Jesus. He sowed into his disciples and then into the apostles. And here we are today in this amazing, gorgeous fire hole. Still listening to preaching the same message that was just as true and powerful 2,000 years ago. Amen. Nothing has changed. Times have changed. Places have changed. Political climate has changed. But the human condition of the soul has never changed. And the solution to the condition of that soul has never changed. He is still Jesus. I would say, like, if God really believed that our nation that our biggest problem was our economy, don't you think he would have sent an economist, a tremendous financial planner? Or if our ills as a nation or as a world was really just all political, we got to take back America now, it's all getting the right person in office, though that's important, vote please, that's what I'm saying, don't you think that he would have sent a tremendous political leader? No, but God knew, and it's true today, our issue has been, is, and will always be sin. That's why he sent a Savior. That's why we get into Christmas next week. There is for sure true kingdom expansion, but there is also false, counterfeit, false kingdom expansion. But with true kingdom expansion, there will always be a kingdom opposition. Right? There is true growth, but there is also false growth. There is true doctrine, but there is also false doctrine. Again, national borders. Okay. So what all of this means for us today is that, friends, it is not judgment day yet. It is not judgment yet, right? During these times where there's crazy stuff going on, you'll always find those people that get on TV, that write books, and they, they took a little conspiracy, took a little CNN, took a little Fox News, put it all in the bowl and shook it all up and say, he's coming back next week. <laughs> Sell your stuff. When in reality... The Bible is clear. We don't know. Only Jesus, even Jesus doesn't know. Only the Father knows. Are we closer today than yesterday? Logically, yes. (laughs) But it's not judgment yet. Right now, it's not the day of judgment. For us, it is a day of evangelizing to start sowing some seeds. Let me say this in layman terms. Tell people about Jesus. One person is excited. Like, share the gospel with the people around you. Because he is the best steak, the best restaurant you will ever eat at. That if you've tasted and you've seen, he is very good. Tell people. Stop being selfish with your junk. Please use that junk that Jesus healed you from, redeemed you from, to help you save other people. That's how he works. Some of you, I just feel like you have so much shame in something that's been done to you or something you've done and you are saved, you've repented, you've been redeemed, you've been healed, and yet the devil is still whispering those lies that you are believing. Don't tell them. Don't share that. They will see you differently, and you are now not telling anybody that story that could be used to convert someone's soul. Some of you have gone through some stuff. And nobody knows about it. Nobody knows about it. Okay. Share the gospel. Because I believe, like Paul said, we are not 
ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God. The gospel saves. That's everybody's biggest issue. It's a soul issue. So what is this message that I'm talking about, this message that false churches will not preach, that false teachers will not preach emphatically, unapologetically, openly, that false Christians will not preach or believe in? What is this mission? What is this message that these false religions are so against? Here is the message, that Jesus is God. Amen. Jesus is eternal. John says that in the beginning was the word of God and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God and the word became flesh. That eternal God, Jesus, took on human flesh, was born through the Virgin Mary to go on a rescue mission to save sinners like you and me, not to make good people better, but to make dead people alive. He grew in wisdom, he grew in stature, he was tempted in every way that we are, but Jesus never sinned. Jesus lived that perfect, sinless life that you and I could not live. He then died a horrendous death that we should have died on the cross in our place for our sins. He was buried in a rich man's tomb, guarded by a Roman soldier, sealed with the Roman seal. Three days later, he went out, they went to the tomb, and it was empty, Because unlike every other false god, every other false religion, every other false spirituality, Jesus accomplished something no one has ever accomplished. He defeated death, sin, Satan, and hell. And Satan's day is coming. He rose from the grave to give us the gift of salvation. Not only that, he ascended to be with his father and gave us the power and the presence of our counselor, of our advocate. He gave us the Holy Spirit. And there will come a day, the day of the harvest, like Matthew says, where the angels, the reapers, will separate the wheat from the tares, and there will come a day where Jesus comes on the white horse in absolute glory, and he will judge the living and the dead, and we will give an account, not to a mirror, but to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and on that day, it will be revealed those who are true and those who are false, and those who are true will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. This is the message. This is the message of the gospel that we will never shy away from. But those who are false will be thrown in the fiery furnace. Friends, I don't edit this mail. I only am called to deliver this mail. These are Jesus' words, not mine. So take it up with Jesus. So if I may, plead with you for a minute as a dying man talking to dying men. If you are not a believer or you are a false believer, you're spiritual, you believe in the good man upstairs, you're a moral person, you're a good person, without the saving and the rescuing, redemptive work of the person of Jesus Christ, you are living in the path of God's wrath. Because again, what is a standard to get into heaven? Perfection. Last time I checked, and we have a saying for this, no one is perfect. Nobody is perfect. Friends, the worst thing for you and for me is not dying. Non-believers are terrified of death. The worst thing is for you to die without knowing the saving, redemptive, rescuing work in a personal way of King Jesus. That's the worst thing. Because if you're a true, genuine believer, we know, as the famous Billy Graham said, that one day you will hear that Billy Graham has died. That is nothing further from the truth. I have just changed my address. I am now more alive than ever. As a genuine believer, we know that to be a reality. But if you're not a believer, 
this is all you got. Okay. So I think of the words that Elijah had for the prophets of Baal, saying, hey, if Baal is your God, go with him. But if Jehovah is your God, Yahweh, follow him. But stop trying to do this whole thing. If you are a genuine believer, hear these comforting words. This life that we have on earth will be as close to hell as it will ever get for you. Amen? That's amazing. That's so comforting. That whatever things you're going through, whatever relational strain, suffering, pain, physical, spiritual, emotional, we pray for healing, but at the same time we know that for the Christian, not just as a life coach saying, the best really is yet to come. Because we know after this life, that's when we'll be more alive than ever. But hear me, if you are not a believer, you're a false believer, you're religious, you're moral, you're pious, you're spiritual, this life on earth is going to be as close to heaven as it will ever get for you. So live it up now. If Baal is your God, kick up your heels, the world is your oyster, paint the town red, go for it. But if Jesus is God, again, hear me, I'm not talking about perfection. None of us are perfect. We've just put our hope in the perfect one. But if Jesus is your God, your Lord, your King, then follow him. Make a decision. Right? So here's my plea to you. If you're here, you are a genuine believer, and you have somebody, Ben, you can come up now, in your life, in your sphere, in your family that doesn't know Jesus. And I did this with my mom, uh, ah, man, 10 years ago, I think, we were eating, and she wasn't a Christian. And it, it just got very practical, you know? When it, when it comes to somebody you love, suddenly the, you know, what is your theological position of this? What is your thing? Like, that kind of goes out the window. And I remember pleading with my mom with tears, and it was very simple. I said, Mom, I know I'm going to heaven. What I can't fathom is going there and not seeing there with me. So I'm pleading with you. Because I love you. Would you get to know Jesus? He loves you. He died for you. And today my mom is a Christian. Okay. Hear me. I want that for you. And even right now, as I'm speaking, I know for most of you, there is a face that pops up in your mind's eye, right? So whether it's like a letter that I wrote to my brother, whether it's a coffee meeting, I want to give you a homework assignment led by the Holy Spirit, I hope, or a phone call, or a car ride, or a flight, um, I'm praying that in the ensuing weeks and months um, that that would happen, the sowing of that seed, telling them about Jesus would happen and you would trust the results to the Lord. Right? And to hear stories from you guys months and maybe years later saying, Frank, you won't believe what happened. Remember November 26, 2023, when you asked us to write, I did that? Um, and it's years later, but he is now a born-again believer. He's done crazier things, right? Um, he was here for the 9 a.m., but some of you guys know Brother Josh McIntyre. If you don't know him, he's, he's a cool guy. Married kids. Um, and him and his wife got baptized last Sunday. Um, and what was so cool about Josh with the other 10 that got baptized is around his tank 
uh, three men that's never been to Tov, they ran up and they surrounded the tank and they were just bawling. Um, it was powerful because I, I know the story behind those tears. Right? Uh, Josh has a powerful story. Ask him about it sometime if you see him. One of the guys was an old man who when Josh wanted nothing to do with Jesus or church or anything, sowed that proverbial seed. And hear me, Josh wasn't like, okay, I'm saved now. It didn't happen that way. But years later, he came to know the Lord, and Josh credits this man, God using this man, to sow truth into his life. And the other two men are two men that Josh brought to Christ. Can we clap for that? That's full circle. This is the potential of us having this urgency. Again, this sharing the gospel, it is not something that you have to do. If you don't do it, you're a junior varsity Christian. No, no. This is, again, like I always say, we get to do this. Like, if we are truly excited that I was going to hell, you saved me, you died for me, you got to know this guy. His name is Jesus. We get to do it. Full circle. So I'm praying for lots of sowing of seeds to happen in the ensuing days, weeks, or months, and to see the fruit that comes from that, not because of what you did, but because of what God did through your obedience, that more people will be in the kingdom of heaven because of your obedience to what he has called you to do, right? To share the gospel, to tell people about Jesus, and hear me, it's kind of funny, but it's kind of annoying too. And I've, I've had this happen. You'll always have that person when I preach, tell people about Jesus, they'll say, but Frank, you don't know which person is elect or not. You don't know which person is predestined. And I would say, well, clearly you're very, very theological and very, very annoying. Both. Because um, why? God knows who belongs to him. You don't, I don't. So it's not my job to go around the room and say, duck, duck, damn, duck, duck, damn. That's not my job. My job is to proclaim this amazing gospel. Don't focus on the hell part. Focus on Jesus who saves you from that hell part. There's a solution. Every other religion will say, you got to die to get to God. God said, I will die for you to get to you. Nobody else offers that. I'm praying that you would receive this amazing gospel reality. He loves you. He wants to save you. He wants to help you. But if you don't think you need any help, then... That's hard. I love you, okay? And my desire is for everybody in this room to have a deep, affectionate, relational, he died for me, he redeemed me, I was a mess, but look at me, He saved me. I need to tell him, her, him, him, her, her, her. Okay. We're going to go into a time of communion. As you walked in, you should have received the elements. If you did not, please raise your hand and we have our ushers give them to you immediately. Um. If you've been at Tove uh, for a little bit, or if you haven't been here for a long time, uh, we do communion once a month. Okay? The last Sunday of every month, we do communion. And hear me, um, I, will, I will say the same message once a month. Okay? But here's why. I, I never want this communion thing as 
religious people are prone to do become this religious box that you check. Okay. This is a time where we remember the lengths at which Jesus went through to make enemies into family. So it came that time where it was time for Jesus to go on this journey, this excruciating journey to the cross. They brought him to the courtyard and they were getting ready to give him the lashes. If you know the story, the, the tool, the execution tool, was called a cat of nine tails or a Roman flagrum with leather straps. And at the end of each leather strap, you had metal balls and hooks made of bone. Um, and what people think is they just whipped them. They didn't whip them. History records um, that the metal balls they would use just like you would tenderize your steak before you eat your steak, they tenderized the body and the back of Jesus till the flesh became very soft and supple. And once it became soft enough, they take the bone hooks, they would swing it and get that as deep as they could. And when they found a good grip, they would pull. And medical reports even say that they've seen entire ribs come out of the body when the soldiers pulled. Um, he's not even at the cross yet. He is bleeding to death. His back is like complete strands of ribbon at this point. They press in these thorns deep into his skull, his brow. He's on his way to the cross, and they put on him this 100-pound wooden beam. It wasn't a new beam. It wasn't a sanded beam. It was a very splintered old beam that they used probably last week for the other criminal. And he's holding this as this is rubbing against his very raw back. The Bible records he starts losing energy because he's losing so much blood. He falls forward, chest first, onto the floor. And most medical experts do believe that in that moment that he had a very real medical chest contusion. They have equated this to you driving 60 miles an hour, head-on collision, no seatbelt, chest into the front of your steering wheel. No cross yet. He's bleeding out. He's in shock. Um, and finally, they get to the execution site. They lay him on the cross, and they take these seven to eight inch iron tapered spikes, and they drive them into the two most sensitive nerve endings of your body, your wrists and your feet, not your palm. It would have ripped right through. So he's there, just, just go there with me, hanging, can't breathe. And so he has to muster up enough strength and energy to pull himself up to get a breath. And every time he pulls himself up, his ribbon-like back is rubbing against that splintered wood as those iron tapered spikes are rotating around his wrist. But that's not even the worst part. The worst part is not the physical pain, though that is gruesome, that even the passion of the Christ doesn't do it justice. The worst part was the relational pain, that for the first time in eternity, the perfect union, the perfect fellowship of father and son was broken where Jesus is yelling with the little breath that he has, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus' very biological human heart really stopped beating, and he died. God died. 
God died. Again, every other religion will say, you die to get to God. God's like, I will die so I can be with you. This is the beauty and the scandalous nature of the gospel. That Jesus had a fully functioning, operating, central nervous system so that he could feel every ounce of pain from the courtyard to the cross reverberating through his very human body. And hear me, I am very descriptive on purpose. I am graphic on purpose. I'm trying to gross you out on purpose. Because what happens, we read our Bible, we go through those Sunday school verses, Jesus loves you, die for you on the cross, and we just kind of skim over it. That we should stop, linger, dwell, thank him, reflect on what that means biologically, physiologically, emotionally, mentally. That's what he did for you, that's what he did for me. This is the gospel. That if you ever doubt God's love for you, go to the foot of the old rugged cross. You will quickly be reminded of, he does love me, not just with words, with very graphic action. He does love you. I want you to get to know that Jesus who went through those lengths. Not to make friends into family, to make enemy into family, to make sons of the devil into sons of God. This is amazing grace, how sweet the sound that you saved a wretch like me. Some of you think you're too good to be saved. I'm going to pray, um, and after I pray, take some time, okay? just really take some time to thank the Lord for the cross, the length at which God took to be with you. Nobody else offers this. And after you're done, uh, John and the team, uh, John actually wrote this song for Good Friday two years ago. It's a powerful song. Uh, this could either be you sing along or sometimes for me, it's just you just listen to the words and let that just soak into your soul. Whatever the Spirit is leading you to do, do that. Let me pray and then we'll do communion. Father, thank you. Thank you that you did not leave us to our own devices. Thank you that you weren't just up there giving us a bunch of rules and principles to live by without any power to live it by. Thank you that you came down as we are entering that season where word became flesh, where God put on flesh. to save sinners, to rescue sinners, to, to resuscitate dead people, to be living people. So God, I pray for the ones in the room. I pray for the ones who are not believers. They don't know you, they're religious, they're spiritual, they believe in a higher power, but they do not have this affectionate, personal, relational, relationship with you, Jesus, that they don't see you as their personal rescuer, redeemer, savior, and king. I pray that you would, Holy Spirit, convert souls today, that the hard soil would become soft, that the distracted, crowded soil would become uncrowded. God, we pray for the ones in the room that, man, none of us are perfect, but we are genuine, born-again believers, and we do love you. But I know all of us, including myself, we all have those people in our lives that they need to know you because we know what's at stake. We know that literally heaven and hell is at stake. Life and death are at stake. So God, I pray as we are led by your Spirit, would you give us a new sense of urgency to share this life-giving, legacy-altering, life-transforming 
gospel with the people around us, that we would not be ashamed of it. We would be proud of it. And that we would just do our part and sow that seed because we know that you will do your part in your perfect timing to cause that growth. And Lord, I am expectantly praying with much anticipation of the stories that we will hear from the sowing that will happen starting today. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for living a life that I couldn't live. Thank you for dying a death that I should have died. And thank you for rising again for the gift of salvation that I could not earn. We pray this, Jesus, in your good name. Amen. Take some time.